One more time, it's such a pleasure to have you here with us. Thank you for, for joining us, wherever, wherever you're from, wherever you're Zooming in from, wherever you're, you're, you're live streaming from. We're so happy to have you in our audience today. I hope that these meetings, series of meetings has been a tremendous blessing, blessing to you. I want to tell you something about Pastor Natufi. Pastor Natufi has ministered in the Seventh-day Adventist Church now for over 20 years as evangelist, pastor, and conference director. His passion for sharing God's word has taken him across the Caribbean, Canada, United States of America, Africa, and England to lead thousands of individuals to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord through baptism. Besides his service to the church, he has also worked in partnership with the Federal Government of Canada as a counselor and career guidance facilitator in the settlement and immigration sector, helping hundreds of internationally trained professionals experience successful integration into the Canadian workforce. He currently serves as a senior pastor of the Abundant Life uh, and the, of the Abundant Life, sorry, and the Christ Way Seventh-day Adventist Church in Edmonton, Alberta. And you know, you can testify for the past couple of weeks you've been hearing and enjoying his preaching. And today I assure you will be no difference. We pray that God will lead you to accept this message, and for you to fully embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ. And for those of us who are, who are already believers, that once again you can say, yes, it was so wonderful for us to have heard the teaching and preaching of Pastor Natufi. God bless you, and enjoy the rest of our service. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Today we're going to sing, I am not alone. So wherever you are, however you may be feeling, just remember that God is right by your side. He's working with you. He's speaking to you. He's holding you in his hand. goes before me he goes before me defender behind me defender behind me so i won't fear i won't fear i'm filled with anointing Cups overflowing, my cups overflowing. No weapon can harm me. Weapon can harm me. See, I won't fear. I won't fear. Sing hallelujah. guides me he always guides me mountains and valleys mountains and valleys his joy is refreshing his joy is refreshing he restores my soul Mercy and goodness, mercy and goodness, give me assurance, give 
give me assurance that I'll see his glory that I'll see his glory thanks to
bow down. You are here. You are here now. You are here now. Have your way. As we bow. One more time. Say, you are here. You are here. Happy Sabbath, everyone. And uh, we at the Philadelphia Seventh-day Adventist Church here in Toronto, Canada, believe in prayer. And so as I petition the throne, I pray that you will be there with me. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we give you thanks for this, your holy Sabbath day of rest. We thank you for allowing us to go through this past week of toil and labor. We thank you for your protection. We thank you for your provision. And we thank you for the many blessings you have given us this past week. Loving Lord, we are so unworthy of the blessings, but Lord, you keep giving it to us over and over again, and for that we are grateful. Lord, we know that you are our Father, and so as we come this morning, we want to thank you for the opportunity of prayer. We come seeking you because we know there is none like you. As we continue worshiping, dear God, we want to place our speaker in your care. You have been with him as he was preparing for this series, and oh God, we pray that you will be with him as he ministers to your people. We know that your word is sharper than any two-edged sword, and it will not come to you void, you said. It will not return to you void. So we pray as he preaches, the words will go forth and hearts will be changed, Lives will be transformed as Elder Natufi delivers your word. We pray, mighty God, for the miraculous working of your Holy Spirit in the lives of all visitors, for those who have not yet come into a closer relationship with you. We pray, dear God, that they will come to see you as light of this world, their friend and their soon-coming king who loves them dearly. We pray for those who know you that they will be drawn closer to you. Continue to guide our steps, continue to... Walk with us, loving Lord, and help us to remember that a day is coming where there will be no more darkness, no more pain, and no more sickness, no more hopelessness in this world. We will be with you forever and ever. In the meantime, dear God, help us to remain faithful to you and help us to always remember that you love us dearly, you want the very best for us, and that you want us to live with you forever. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Oh, 
Don't you just love that song? Hope has a name, and his name is Jesus. Well, my friends, we've come to the final Sabbath, the final Saturday of our series, Finding Hope in Times of Crisis. And I really pray that as we've spent time together in the Word, that the Holy Spirit has spoken to you directly, and that you have experienced a deeper appreciation for the Word of God, a deeper passion for the Word of God. You know, my friends, the best is still yet to come because what you have experienced here through the series is the appetizer. Guess what? Every single day you have the opportunity to spend time in the presence of God, spend time in the word of God to experience the outpouring and the downloading of God's glory and God's power and God's anointing into your life. And so I want to encourage you to allow this to be the beginning of greater things to come for you. Spending time in the Word, spending time in prayer, spending time in meditation, experiencing the goodness and the power of God. Jesus Christ said in John 17 verse 3, this is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Indeed, in the Word of God, we come into contact with the author of hope and his name is Jesus. And so welcome to our final Saturday morning. We will be finishing tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern time. But I want to welcome you to our, um, to our final Saturday morning in this series. And I want to speak on the subject, the call of hope, the call of hope. I will take you to the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible. And in the book of Revelation, we will look at Revelation 14 from verse uh, 6 to verse 13, um, a passage we refer to as the three angels message, Revelation 14 verses 6 to 13. But before we read it, I want to invite you to please bow your heads with me in prayer as we speak to our heavenly father, almighty God, thank you for this day. Indeed, this is the day that you have made. And so we will rejoice and we will be glad in it. We pray, Father, that as we open up your word, once again, you may open up the eyes of our understanding and cause us to see you in ways we have never ex seen you before. Cause us to experience you in ways we have never experienced you before, dear Father. Cause us to encounter you in all your fullness, in all your glory, in all your power. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us, break us, melt us, mold us, fill us with your supernatural power. And do, Father, in us, with us, and through us what only you can do, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. The call of hope, Revelation 14. And I want to read from verse 6 to verse 13, and here is what it says. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and the earth and the seas and the fountains of water. That's the first angel. Along comes the second angel in Revelation 14 verse 8. And the second angel comes saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed saying, 
with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and with brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Verse 13, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Verse 13, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, write, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. The call of hope. The call of hope. Here in this passage in Revelation 14, 6 to 13, we see God's final call of hope. And you would recognize as we read this passage, this passage entailed three angels. Now the word angel in Greek is the word angelos and it refers to messenger. So this refers to three messengers who have a specific message for God's end time people. And this message is, is, is a summary of God's final call of hope for humanity. As I said, this message has three parts. So this call of hope is God's threefold call of love, because we've learned so far that God is all about love. In 1 John 4 verse 8, we remember that he is introduced as the God who is in his very essence love. So because God is a God of love and everything God does is within the context of love, we understand that this very message found in Revelation chapter 14 is founded upon the principle of God's eternal love. And so it is God's threefold call of love. The first call is a call of purpose or a call to purpose. The second call is a call to awareness. And the final call is a call to destiny. Let's break it down. The first call is a call to purpose. And we see it in Revelation chapter 14, uh, verses 6 and 7. It's a call to purpose. And this purpose is introduced to us by the everlasting gospel, which is for all humanity. That informs me that no matter who you are, no matter what your race is, no matter no matter what your color is, no matter where you come from, no matter what country you're born in, no matter who you are, God has a call to purpose for you. And this purpose is founded and grounded upon the reality of God's word. It's a call to purpose. And we see that purpose unfolding to us in uh, Revelation 14 verse 7, where we are called to fear God, that is to enter into an intimate relationship with him, understand in order for you to truly fulfill your purpose, you need to begin by entering into a personal relationship with God who is your creator, because it is your creator who ultimately and who truly knows what your purpose is. He created you. And so he knows what your purpose is. We are told to fear God, to enter into a relationship with him. And we are called to give glory to him. And here we see the sum total of our purpose. To give glory to God in Isaiah 43 verse 7, we are told that we were formed and fashioned for God's glory. And so to truly fulfill your purpose, you need to enter into a deep encounter with God and that encounter now fills you and anoints you with the power of God, which enables you to fulfill your true purpose, which is to glorify God. And we understand that that purpose is further manifested and magnified within the context of worship. Worship is declaring the worth of God. 
Worship is declaring the worth of God, the power of God, the might of God, the glory of God, the anointing of God. That's what worship is in its truest sense. So when you see the praise team coming up here and singing, understand that the praise team isn't even isn't given a performance, but the praise team is magnifying the worth and the glory of God. Come, I hear David say, and magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Worship is an expression of the power and the glory of God. And so this first call is a call to purpose. The second call given by the second angel, we come across it in Revelation 14, verse 8, is a call to awareness. You see, not only as Christians are we called to worship God, are we called to enter into a relationship with God, not only as Christians are we called to magnify God in all his multifaceted glory, but we are called to be aware. Be aware of what is happening around us. Understand that there is a power of deception operational in this world that is leading countless individuals down the road to perdition. So the second call is a call to awareness. And I want us to take time to reflect on that second call. Notice what it says here in Revelation 14 verse 8. This call to awareness, it makes us aware of a power called Babylon, which is fallen. Now, my friends, this may come across as rather strange to some individuals because those of us who study prophecy, we would know that Revelation was written in about AD 96. AD 96, that is decades after Christ, after Christ ascended into heaven, after his earthly ministry. And Babylon is found in the Old Testament. And we know that the kingdom of Babylon, as we study the book of Daniel, the kingdom of Babylon fell to the Persian Empire on October 13, 539 BC. That is centuries before Christ came to this earth, the kingdom of Babylon was already fallen. It fell to the Medes and the Persians on October 13th. 539 BC. So what in the world is John the Revelator speaking of here in AD 96 that Babylon is fallen, is fallen? And um, what this means in the, origi in the original Greek construction of the text is that it means Babylon is falling and Babylon is continuing to fall. This makes the text even more complex because what in the world are you speaking about that Babylon is falling and is continuing to fall when you are writing this in 8096 when we know by history that Babylon fell centuries ago to the Medes and the Persians on October 13, 539 BC. Well, we have a mystery before us. And to solve this mystery, we need to understand that Babylon is spoken of here within the context of its symbolic nature. The context of its symbolic nature. It says Babylon is falling and is continuing to fall, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And we understood from a previous presentation that the wine of the wrath of her fornication here is her false doctrines. So let's solve this mystery. Let's solve this mystery. And to solve this mystery, we need to go back into the Old Testament, to the first book of the Bible, to the book of Genesis 10, Genesis chapter 10 and chapter 11. And in Genesis 10, we are introduced to an individual called Nimrod in Genesis 10, who is described as a mighty hunter before God or in the place of God based on the original Hebrew. Nimrod, Nimrod is a mighty hunter in the place of God who seeks to exalt himself above the will of God. Nimrod, we discover in Genesis 10, is the founder of Babylon. Nimrod was the one who influenced the individuals after the flood to build the Tower of Babel, from which we get our word Babylon. Babel meaning confusion. So Nimrod is the father of Babel, the father of confusion. Let me tell you something about Nimrod. Nimrod was seen uh, by the Babylonians as the sun god. 
when Nimrod died, they believed that Nimrod graduated to become the sun god. And Nimrod had a wife called Semiramis. And something very interesting happened. After Nimrod died, Semiramis became pregnant, and that was about to create a scandal in Babylon. They tried to reach Olivia Pope to help solve the scandal, but she was busy. She couldn't talk to them. So they figured out, how can we solve this scandal where Semiramis is pregnant after Nimrod dies? And so here is what they came to believe. They came to believe that Nimrod, once he died, he became the sun god. And here's what happened. Semiramis was sitting on her balcony one afternoon, one bright sunny afternoon, and the rays of the sun penetrated her. And the rays of the sun impregnated her. And Semiramis gave birth to a baby. And that baby's name was Tammuz. And guess what day the baby was born? That baby was born on December 25th. And so we have the illegitimate child of Semiramis, Nimrod's widow, giving birth to a son called Tammuz on December 25th. And this whole concept and construct of Babylon became a philosophical and a spiritual and a, and a political reality to exert itself against the word of God and to exalt itself above the word of God. And so what we see happening centuries later, centuries later, understand this, that this Babylonian pagan thought has so infiltrated the mindsets of individuals, has so infiltrated the culture of individuals that what happened is that when Constantine centuries later would join the church, and we preached about that a few weeks, a few days ago, when Constantine now joined the church, what Constantine did is that, remember, it was a political move to strengthen his weakening empire. So Constantine never really became a Christian. He just joined the church to merge paganism with Christianity. And so what Constantine did when he merged paganism with Christianity is that he brought all the pagan ideologies and philosophies into the church and he pinned Christian emblems upon them. For instance, as an example, he took the, the pagan god, Tammuz, who was the son of the sun god, born on December 25th, and he pinned that onto Christ. And so that's how we came to believe that Christ was born on December 25th. It had nothing to do with the actual birth of Christ, but it came from that pagan mindset and ideology. And so back to Revelation chapter 14 and verse 8, we see here Babylon is falling and is continuing to fall. Understand this, that the agenda of Babylon is to unite the world in rebellion against God. Mm -hmm. After the flood in Genesis chapter 11, God instructed them to disperse and to populate the earth. What did Babylon do? Babylon sought to unite them together to rebel against the word of God and to build the Tower of Babel. But the Bible would declare, the Bible would declare centuries later that no matter what they do, understand this, in Daniel chapter 2, verse 43, they will not cleave together just as iron does not mix with clay. And so we, we, we see here the second message of the three angels' messages is a call to awareness. First, we are called to purpose. Understand what your purpose is. Your purpose is to glorify and magnify God. Then we see we are called to awareness. Recognize that there is a power operating in society, operating in the political realm, yea, even in the spiritual realm, that is seeking to undermine the authority and the supremacy of God's word. So we have a call to purpose, we have a call to destiny, rather we have a call to awareness, and number three, we have a call to destiny. Come with me. As we look at the third angel's message, Revelation 14 and verse 9, and a third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, if any individual worships the beast, now we get into some deep stuff now, my friends. 
Here's what the third angel says. If anyone worships the beast, Lord have mercy, I'm getting hot here this morning. If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same, Revelation 14 verse 10, shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, those who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. What in the world? I said, what in the world is this talking about? Let's break it down. Let's go back to Revelation 14. Revelation 14 verse 9. If anyone worships the beast and his image, what is the beast? Based on the context here, we understand that the beast is representative of a religio-political system which has the authority and the power and the influence to lead individuals into a type of worship that contradicts the prescription of God's word, or rather, that contradicts the way God calls us to worship and the way he expects us to worship him. Now, you know what, my friends? This text is actually very easy to explain simply because there is a, partic a particular denomination that has taken full responsibility for this text. So it's not about us calling anybody out, but it is about this denomination itself taking personal responsibility for this text and this will blow your mind. I'm not saying what I heard about this church, or I'm not saying what individuals who have nothing to do with this church told me about this church, but I'm gonna share with you what this church says about its own self, and this will blow your mind. And so the question is asked, within the context of this image spoken of here in Revelation 14 verse nine, the question is asked, what does the Church of Rome or the Roman Catholic Church claim as the sign of its authority or as its image? Does it claim anything as a sign of its authority? Listen to this quotation. And this is taken from one of their premier publications called the Roman, the Catholic Record. And it is a September 1st edition, the year 1923. The Roman Catholic record, September 1, 1923. And this is what they write, and I quote, Sunday is our mark of authority. We see the mark spoken of here in Revelation 14, verse 9 and 10. They say Sunday is our mark of authority. They go on to write that the church, referring to the Roman Catholic Church, is above the Bible. That's what they're saying about themselves. The church is above the Bible, and this transference of Sabbath observance, that is, shifting Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday, they said this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. End of quote. Here it is. So this religious political power spoken of here, the Catholic Church has identified itself as this religious political power, and they say that the image or the mark of authority is calling individuals to worship on Sunday, taking full responsibility for that change for we learned a few nights ago in the Roman Catholic Catechism where they declared that Sabbath, Saturday, is the true Sabbath. And the reason why they worship on Sunday instead of Saturday is because they themselves transferred the solemnity 
of the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. Here we see, my friends, in Revelation 14, 6 to 13, that this call of hope is God's threefold call of love. It is a call to purpose. It is a call to awareness. And it is a call to destiny. Understand this, that there are only two destinies. If you choose to follow the agenda of the beast, if you choose to follow the agenda of man that leads us to worship on Sunday, which is declared to be the Sabbath, as opposed to following God's agenda, which calls for us to recognize Saturday as a Sabbath, my friends, there are only two destinies. If we follow the beast, our destiny, according to Revelation chapter uh, 14, verse 10, would be destruction. But if we choose the agenda of the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the earth, our destiny, my friends, will be what is described in Revelation 14, 12 to 13. Let me read it. You see, while the devil deceives masses of individuals and leads them to eternal perdition and destruction, God has a special group of individuals who will prevail, hallelujah. And they are found in Revelation 14, 12 to 13. It says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth, yea, Set the spirit that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. There it is, my friends. There it is. And this destiny is so powerful. As long as we stay grounded upon the word of God, grounded upon the will of God, locked up and tied up in a love relationship with God, my friends, the Bible says, even if we die physically, the anointing that we had in our life, the anointing that we had, the relationship we had with God, my friends, even if we die physically, that anointing will follow us. Hallelujah. I'm told that one day Jesus is going to call your name. And even if you died, I, I'm told that when the trumpet sounds that the dead in Christ will rise and no grave, no cemetery will hold your body down. One day somebody asked me, Pastor, well, what about what's going to happen to individuals who say died in a plane crash and say the plane exploded and their bodies disintegrated? What about individuals who, who drowned in the sea and a, and, a, and a fish ate them and digested them and somebody ate the fish? What's going to happen to them? How, how, how is God going to be able to find them on resurrection morning, my friends? Understand this, that God's thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither as God's word ways your ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are his thoughts higher than your thoughts and his ways higher than your ways. Think about this. If God in Genesis chapter two, verse seven, can stoop down and form man out of the dust of the ground, out of dust, that is the nothingness of dirt. If God could stoop down and form man out of the dust of the ground and can breathe into man's nostrils, the breath of life and man can become a living soul. Understand that it doesn't matter if a fish ate you and digested you. Doesn't matter if your body exploded Exploded. Doesn't matter, my friends, if your if your body is nowhere to be found, as long as you are in the anointing of God, the anointing of God has the power to bring you back. No grave, no shark, no whale, no fire, no principality, no power, no force, no things present, no things to come shall be able to separate you from the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My friends, God has a plan. God has planned an eternal destiny of joy and peace and glory for you. And tonight, today, rather this morning, he is calling you into the eternal power of his word to prepare you for that 
reality. He's calling you into his word. Listen to what he says. Let's go now to the last book, our last text, the last book of, 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 of the Bible. And the last chapter of the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 22. And I want you to look at verse 14. It says, blessed are they that do his commandments, that keep his word, that live in his word, that they might have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. My friends, God has planned an eternal destiny of joy, peace, and glory for you. And today, right now, this morning, he is calling you into the eternal power of his word. You know why? Because God can only save you in his word. God can only save you in his anointing. He's calling you into his word. He's calling you into his will. He's calling you into his purpose. He's calling you into his destiny for you, my friend. Can you hear him calling you? Can you hear him calling you one more time? Can you hear him pleading with you? Can you feel him pursuing you? My friends, this morning, the only wise thing to do and the only sensible thing to do and the only sustainable thing to do is to surrender your life to the greatest power in the universe. And that is the power of God's love. And I assure you, that as you surrender to the power of God's love, he will embrace you. He will forgive you. He will transform you. He will empower you. He will anoint you. He will make you into a new creation. It doesn't matter what you've done, where you've been, how many times you've messed up. He specializes in new beginnings. The question today is, Will you allow Jesus to have his way in your life? For years, the devil has had his way in your life. And you've seen the result. Misery, distress, frustration, heartache, heartbreaks. Christ is calling you to let him have his way in your life. My friends, this is your heart's desire. If it is, would you make a commitment right now to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? And if it is your desire, my friends, even right now, to go all the way with him into baptism, to seal that decision, would you please just sign quickly that card in the link, put in your name and your phone number so we can connect with you, to pray with you, and to encourage you in your newfound encounter with Christ. Would you, would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you, dear God, for your word. Thank you, dear God, for your, your call of hope, which is a call to purpose, a call to awareness, and a call to destiny. Father, we hear you calling, and we surrender to your call, and we ask, Father, that you may have your way in our lives. Destroy the strongholds of the enemy in the name of Jesus, Spirit of the living God. Fall afresh on us, break us, melt us, mold us, fill us with your supernatural power. We pray in the precious, saving, healing name of Jesus Christ, dear Father, perfect the work that you are beginning in us even now. Bless those individuals who are determined to commit their lives to you, dear Father. Forgive them for their sins. Cover them, dear Father, in the anointing of Jesus Christ. Fill them with your power, Ephesians 3 verse 19. Fill them with your anointing. Fill them with your power. Fill them with your glory, we pray, dear Father. We claim it. We believe it. We accept it. We embrace it. 
and we celebrate it in the precious, saving, healing name of Jesus Christ. Let all those who love him say, Amen. Amen. My friends, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. We aren't done yet. We're going to be back here this evening at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. And the subject this evening is knowing when to let go. See you this evening, my friends. God bless you. I'm crying.